So as you've uh, just heard, I'm going to walk you through a presentation called Reverse Engineering Retail. Before we do that, I'm going to give you a quick espresso shot to wake us all up introducing Fitch. So I'm literally going to take a minute to just talk about Fitch. Um, you'd have seen a number of these stores in that little sizzle film, including the new T-Mobile store uh, up in Vegas. And you notice that we design, obviously, retail stores. But what you might not know is that about half our work is actually for brands that pre present their products and services and other people's retail environments. And it's really those two left and right hands that we work on, all the way through the value index, mass, mass plus, luxury, value for money. And increasingly, we're moving away from permanent retail to do sort of temporary and, and sort of semi-permanent that we'll touch on later on. I'm not going to push you through the obligatory agency map, but I think the key point here is, albeit we're right over here on the west-hand side, some of the key trends in the world in retail are all coming out of Korea and China at the moment. And I say that as a very proud uh, European who's living in America. There's actually lots of exciting things. And our studios are kind of feeding with the trends and the latest insights. A lot of our projects, fully enough, all, all roads and money goes to China at the moment. And when I get challenged of, well, what's going on over there that's just, you know, catching our eye? Well, clearly, lots of these sort of leapfrog brands, they are, they are born with a single view. They don't have any legacy sort of technology and architecture systems that's holding them back. And what I love about them particularly is how fearless they are in creating new expressions, new, uh, new experiences. And the one thing that really sort of struck me that was the catalyst for this talk is a lot of what they're doing is counterintuitive. It's absolutely not what I would have thought would be the natural way to, to go. So they're creating uh, optician stores that are sort of sculptural landscapes and you can't find the product. Uh, mobile convenience stores without uh, any staff. And my actually favorite in Seoul is um, uh, it's kind of like their Best Buy, and it's called Electromart, where it's a superhero-led sort of cartoon. And then when you're in this big space, it's got drones flying around and gaming. It is like a leisure park where you experience all these electrical things. They're doing some just amazing things over there that we could all kind of um, learn from. I'm sure you know that Fitch is all about redesign and architecture, but an awful lot we're doing uh, at the moment is around retail transformation and innovation design and how we've kind of reshaped our studio. And really, everything that we do creatively is around this, this central philosophy that a great shopping experience is a combination of physical, human, and digital together. And each, each characteristic has a different benefit. So physicality, if you go to physical space, there's an immediacy, it's fully immersive, the tactility, sensorial. When I say human, it's really about the staff and or brand ambassadors, coaches, how they engage with us. And they have this ability to bring sort of kindness and empathy. And digital clearly brings in uh, long tails, amazing interactive and storytelling. So every sort of brand and retail experience really needs to have a different combination of this PhD, and that's runs through absolutely everything. And this talk is really going to blow up an awful lot of things that I've learned over the years, but there are some sort of evergreens that I'm sure will continue for the next few. So, you know, fantastic visual merchandising. It kind of went off, off track a few years ago. I think that's really going to be coming back and very strong uh, and passionate staff and digital making it easy will be some things that will never go. Uh, I was just briefly introduced there. I'm a designer, a retail designer, kind of follow me, interact with me on social. And uh, I've been doing it a long time. And allegedly, I'm quite good at it. And as you can hear, I'm a Brit who now lives in New York, so I'm British. So when you put those three together, you're thinking, wow, he's going to be one hell of an arrogant person. <laughs> and you're probably right. Um, 
one plus one equals that. But actually, I actually believe that I'm actually an idiot. And retail design at the moment increasingly makes me feel like an idiot every day. And really why, and you just had a glimpse of that, everything you and I have learned about retailing previously is now wrong. So I've got my 20 plus years, everything I've learned is wrong. So the old rules of retail do not apply. I say that to myself every day. Now I say that as someone who loves shopping, I love the art, buying things and the endorphins, I love designing spaces and I love interior design and architecture. But really I have had to really recode my head and my team around thinking around how do we re-engineer retail going forward to create something completely different. I was very much brought up with this idea and sadly, that's not the case. Uh, they won't, they'll all be at home in their comfy sofas. That is really our principal challenge, right? How do we get people off the comfy sofas? And I'm, I'm extremely lazy as well. So to design the future of shopping, uh, my provocation is there are two things that we need to do. We need to do together. Some older people in the room, you may say, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. My challenge is, if you think intuitively the right decision to make, turn 180 degrees, go in the other direction, that could actually be the right way to go. Because everything is different now. And that can be really painful. That can be really humbling. Because you thought you knew the answer, it was logical. It's actually not. Counterintuitivity is actually, I believe, the future to come up with better, greater ideas. And we need to, we need to re engineer ourselves as well as uh, the designers and innovations we have. So, with that, uh, we've put together 10 rules for retail transformation. And really, the body of this, we're going to roll our way through these 10. They're not in any particular order. I'm sure there's 11 or 12, but that's an ugly number. And each one is going to have sort of a human insight that will uh, hopefully unpack the provocation. Uh, these 10 provocations, so let's get cracking. First is checking in, not checking out. And the human insight there is, is, is as people, as humans, we want to be acknowledged and rewarded when we arrive somebody. Now, when you were looking at that slide, checking in, not checking out, I would imagine a lot of you are thinking about the latest sort of... Um, Amazon Four Go stores, ago, we started and I'm sure wonder. we've all enjoyed watching these films what and how they've developed like over the last three or four years in Seattle. Store, grab what you want and just go. And I won't push you through that whole film, but really I want to tell you my experience as opposed to a sort of third party uh, auditing. Um, I just coincidentally, I was in Chicago last week, and I managed to be there just as that first one opened in the business district of Chicago. It's a very small store. It was crazy busy. There was queues all around the block. There was lots of staff to kind of manage it all. But I mystery shopped it on a couple of occasions. This is actually my bill. And I did lots of sort of exercises of taking things off the shelves and putting them back and in and out of bags. And uh, the receipt was absolutely perfect. So they kind of nailed it on that. And I, I was kind of pleasantly surprised with it. But what I was surprised about was there was quite a lot of staff there, and I imagine because this is sort of opening week, explaining to people how to download the app in the uh, line outside, explaining to people how to zip on your way in as you were to an airport gate, and also just reloading the shelves because it was so busy, lots of products were um, scooting off the shelves. So there was actually quite a lot of uh, human, uh, a lot of staff in there to interact to. And we've all been kind of reading and uh, seeing these headlines the last few weeks of, uh, of Jeff saying that there's an ambition now if they can uh, land the technology so it's scalable at the right price, it could get to 3,000 stores. The one I went to in uh, Chicago was very much about meal on the runs. So at lunchtime, literally 1,000 people came down from the towers and went there and had a very simple sort of two to three minute shopping experience. That is really going to challenge the subways and the prets of this world. And I read that they're emphasizing on convenience as opposed to uh, product stretch at the moment. And that, that came through quite clearly. But what also sort of struck me was, um, as long as you have a product or commodity for sale that has a physical package, it could be merchandised off one of these shelves. If it's a soft shirt or something that's all bendy, I, I'm sure that will conflict with all the, uh, the, you know, the technology above. But it was really, really clever, so I can imagine them uh, selling future, uh, lots of other pr products in the future. For me, there's a, there's a key watch out there, though, that um, this sort of super frictionless shop can create the disengagement. And uh, 
I didn't see that last week, but I kind of hope that um, uh, Amazon Go keep um, staff in the store to engage and they don't remove them completely. And there is still no greater feeling than going to a sp space and being sort of acknowledged as if you were a regular by the barman who knows your drink. I think that's just such a, a massive benefit for physical spaces. The second provocation is from pure play to blended. And the insight there is excitement and exhilaration that taps all senses simultaneously. That's really what we're looking for to get off the sofa that we were just looking at. And for years, we've all been designing a lot of us just pure play stores that sell products. But really, the blend is really how hospitality, entertainment, leisure, service, they're all starting to come together. And there's all these new types of experiments and formats. And this is absolutely fascinating. A couple of years ago, Fish, we went all around the world and, and saw like 250 of the latest retail concepts, models, prototypes, laboratories. And we came back, we tried to make sense of them. And we continue to do this. And as opposed to categorizing retail into, well, that's telco, that's grocery, that's apparel, this is beauty, we're actually starting to see that there are nine clear, I don't know if you can see the bottom one, co-ops, experience themes. So, and these, each theme is a different blend of hospitality, leisure, and retail coming together. So just to give you a flavor of a couple of these, let me run you through. The first is uh, a London brand, very, an old brand that I love, Rafa Cycling Club. And here, this is a campfire. This is the experience theme. And a campfire is very much, the, the metaphor of it is, it's people coming together around something hot and uh, sharing stories and conversation. People have shared passions. And here on this middle-aged cycling brand, what do they call it, mammals, middle-aged men in Lycra, they come to this space, they buy beautifully expensive products, parole, accessories, that's fantastic to the coffee shop and food offer. And through the Tour de France and big days, uh, we all come together to watch the race together. So it's very much this combination of product, hospitality, entertainment spots all together. And they currently have another one in uh, Soho, Manhattan. A workshop is something very different. Uh, probably less commerce happens directly here. This is uh, an experiment, ongoing experiment with IKEA. Uh, we're, so we're over in Copenhagen here. And it's a sort of an open lab laboratory. And at this point in time when we were there, they were experimenting with sleep and new products and services. And, but it's sort of open source. People are encouraged to come, get involved, and have sort of a co-creative point of view. And finally, launch pads, an easy one to get out of those nine. It's when you're launching a new sort of complex idea or, or innovation or platform to the world. And out in Taiwan, we found this genius um, electric scooter brand where actually the, the space, it wasn't selling really. It was help people understand the modular uh, batteries that would be found around the urban areas and how you could keep your, your scooter going. So it was purely a launch pad to explain a new way of going about it. So there are just a few thoughts around these new blends, new experience themes, and that can be absolutely fascinating to work out what, where you know, different brands go in the future. Our first retail transformation story is Hamleys, uh, and I was absolutely fascinated by this piece of data here. Hopefully you're taking it in. This is about missions, shopper missions, and you can see a line here. This is the reason that people went just to do stuff in a Hamleys luxury toy store, as opposed to they went there deliberately to buy something. And actually, the main amount of revenue is from the leisure, the day out, the family day out, less than it's just a pure shopping channel. And it's with that that we um, gave us the, the, the insight to create a number of different formats, including this enormous uh, two-floored flagship store in Moscow that is absolutely a blend of paid rides, food, sugar stops, merchandise, etc. And the merchandise really becomes uh, a memento of an amazing day out with the family. Let's play the film.
there we are, uh, the blend of hospitality, leisure, entertainment, retail all coming together. Third one, permanent to agile. The insight here is uh, the expectation is for new and different every visit. And again, I keep going back to that sofa image. That's, that is the expectation. Now, that's really the, uh, been the challenge with permanent retail that we've kind of all known and loved for years. And we're all looking at, I think this is the 10th year anniversary of, uh, of pop-ups. And they've evolved a little bit, but not enough, I would say. But clearly, they're really starting to make some, um, some proper revenue there. And what we see as Fitch is the real opportunity here is uh, not just the pop-ups that have gone from like one week to one month, maybe to six months, and classic uh, uh, lease, lease developers who are looking to get you into three to, to ten year lease, is this area in between of one to two years. And we feel that that's really what uh, a lot of the, the digitally native brands who want to come into bricks and mortar are looking for. They only really want to commit for maybe a year and then move somewhere else and have that flexibility. They don't want to commit to enormous amount of retail expenditure for maybe a year, maybe two at the absolute max. But they're hella, definitely not going to go for a five or a 10 year lease. And it's really that sense of agility that we're increasingly seeing in retail. You and I have all been looking and talking about story since its inception in 2011. The only reason I kind of dusted it down and brought it back is, is that it was uh, bought by Macy's uh, in spring this year. And I had the pleasure of meeting the founder, Rachel, a few weeks ago. And she's gone into Macy's to be the first brand experience officer, which is really interesting. But I just love you know, how it's a, read it verbatim, it's a retail concept that takes the point of view of a magazine, changes like a gallery, and sells things like a store. So it's still commercial, but has that constant agility and change. That's without a doubt one of the, the key, key priorities for future retail. We all know what uh, sticker shock is. We fall in love with something in store, we try it on, we look at it and go, oh my goodness, can't afford that, and walk out. Well, reverse sticker shock, uh, I'll, I will explain in a moment. Uh, but the insight here is, of course, we're continually looking for great value. However, we're also looking for a greater level of transparency and honesty from brands. And my sort of first reverse sticker shock, a bit I didn't know the phrase at the time, is when I went into my first Zara when it launched in the UK. I think it was over 15 years ago, maybe longer. And I was wowed. It was on the high street. It was beautiful designed and architecture, fantastic interior. Not this one. This is a New York one. Uh, went in, great lighting, beautiful product, silhouettes, fitting room, tried it on knew that I couldn't afford anything, then looked at it and went, wow, I can actually afford it. And it was that moment which caught me, that reverse sticker shock. And I think Zara and some others have done that extremely well over the years of sort of the over-promise. It feels like a luxury brand, but it's actually sort of a mass plus uh, sort of bridge positioning. I just think that's really interesting. However, you know, just if you kind of read that quote there, as consumers, and definitely millennials, we're all increasingly looking for brands that are more honest and transparent. And they're almost not playing a trick on us. So maybe that reverse sticker shock was actually a bit of a trick. So maybe that doesn't have a future in this sort of overtly transparent world. Uh, and that's, a, that's an open question. Evelyn, again, you, you and I have been looking at it for years. They always said they weren't going to go into brick and mortar. They now have. But I love their positioning. It's around radical transparency. So transparency is really uh, the future there. Halfway through, commodity to service. The insight is, the sort of the value exchange was, I come into your store and I buy something for you, we barter, we hand something over and I get it. Well, I feel where retail is going, it's more about what actually can I achieve with you? Can I cook a, 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 an economic great meal for my family tonight? How can you help me get fitter? How can you help me? So it's really gone to, what can I achieve with you? Is the, the consumer insight. I love these two images. Uh, one is an old boy shopping for vinyl records in a market stall in the middle of a, a town somewhere. And he's under a green fabric canopy, so he's shopping for vinyl, physical commodity. And I took this shot um, back in the spring in Manhattan, Midtown, where as opposed to FedEx or another courier was just throwing boxed at you know, get thrown out the back and tumble onto the sidewalk into the gutter. They're actually starting to put up these, these marquees, these little tents, so that then that becomes the distribution point to take them to the uh, apartments in the area. And I just love that kind of challenge of this is both retail in a modern world, and that's kind of where it started, and it's still all about the, uh, the, green, uh, the green tent. And anyway, I slightly sidetracked there, because my 
point really is that, um, or my provocation is, the future of shopping is not retail, it's actually service. And let me unpack that. Retail, increasingly feeling is, is about the transaction, the per purchase, the fulfillment, and that is just so brilliantly being done by removing all the pain points in physical, uh, mainly through digital apps. However, the opportunity for shopping is that it's much more around the destination, it's about the community engagement, about the entertainment, having fun, and the leisure side of it. And the, really, the, the secret sauce here that this doesn't have is the service, where again, with great staff, you can create empathy, you know, connection, and joy. And really, that's our kind of bet up there. And it's uh, and, not or. You, you need both of them. So if any of you have been followed Fitch the last few years, you would have no doubt been bored by our Mind States uh, shopper model, which is that from a universal, uh, sorry, from a global uh, piece of research, we identified that there are three different types of shopper mindset states. Sometimes I'm in locating mode, sometimes I'm exploring, and sometimes I'm dreaming. And for years now at Fitch, we've been using this as sort of our foundation to come up with ideas on how do we create better experiences at retail. But there's really a new layer now, and hopefully you can see maybe on the side screens here, this increasing sort of service needs. And again, I think this sort of PhD, this isn't just about staff and how there is support to it. So services, help me find it, anticipate me, rescue me, and exploring, advise me, engage me, help me sort of make sense of it, summarize all this complexity. And on services, spoil me, connect me to the community. So really new sort of areas to explore there around service needs. Not selling, helping people buy. So that, that might be a little bit uh, provocative. So we're so informed by research online that the shoppers were all so smart. And embarrassingly, when you actually know more than the staff in the store that you walk into. And I've done so much work in automotive over the years, and it's a passion of mine. And it used to be that we used to go to a car dealership between five to seven times to meet people, to chat, to barter, to test drive. And now, as an average in Europe, it's down, line, down to like one to maybe one and a half times. So people are really walking in much more informed, knowing what they want. So all the balloons and Mr. Mr. Salesman in his shiny suit trying to sell you something that he's incentivized to is now completely wrong. So clearly, uh, staff incentivization in retail is changing, but needs to change more with net promoter scores. Less about scripts, more about helping me. And, you know, really, I think more than sell, the shift is from salesmen towards coaches, guides, and mentors. That's really uh, the big shift that we're going to make. Ret uh, retail transformation number two is Lincoln Co., which is a Chinese auto manufacturer, launched in China, going to move, launch in Europe next year, maybe coming to America, trade embargoes aside. And it's a new type of car platform where it's all about the sharing economy. So here, the actual physical space that presents this story is really a launch pad that explains this new offer. So they are sort of designing spaces for, uh, to launch new car brands that a lot of the time don't actually have cars in them. So just a wholesale change there around the shift from selling commodities in space to selling ideas and services in a space. We've, we've all joked about this in the past, yeah? So let's get into it. Increasingly, we're seeing research saying big is overwhelming. And because we've become so smart at sort of 
locating what we want on our smartphones using uh, searching, that when you walk into a big store that's got hundreds of thousands of SKUs, it's like, why do I have to navigate this? Why can't I just go to the one I want? So there's a real sort of change there. So big is increasingly, big, you know, I, I was surprised by this actually. I saw this in a piece of research. Big is increasingly perceived that there's less care for the products if you have more products in a space. So increasingly shoppers are looking for you know, bring it to me, create it for me. Create is a bit of an overused buzzword, but there we are. And really sort of the summary there is that um, I think we increasingly go to physical space for expertise, which is the service dynamic, and internet is really for the abundance. So there's a real sort of shift there. We've all been seeing lots more of sort of smaller, a lot of the maybe urban uh, formats that have been experimented with. Some are proving to be highly commercial. There's still lots of experiments, and I think it's not just about being smaller, it's about increasing the number of uh, visits to frequency, because frequency equals relevancy in, um, re rel uh, relative to uh, uh, your relationship with a brand or a store. But my challenge is for all sort of retailers is when they start the conversation is, well, you know, we're 2,000 square foot or whatever, is that really don't think that starting with the size of a space is, is the right approach. And I actually feel that time is actually the new currency or the new metric that we need to be creating stores around. So how can we create the best 20 seconds for somebody in a day? Or what could be the best 20 minutes of their day? And there are lots of kind of different ideas or sort of uh, tools on how you can actually sort of day part the day and create a very different types of experience. And I absolutely advocate that over starting with um, square footage and volume. Uh, German, very high-end uh, kitchen uh, cleaning appliances. They have these enormous experience centers in cities, outside city centers, all around the world, but increasingly less relevant to all millennials. We have the opportunity to create the smaller uh, 2,200 square foot one. Let's have a quick look. Um, just pushing on, uh, and that store actually, the very first opened in Toronto about four weeks ago. I haven't yet to go to it. First prototype, pilot, then the second one I think is going to be in um, Amsterdam. But it's really interesting how we've had to tell the whole Miele story with the hundreds of uh, SKU lines in a very small space, and it's all around connecting with younger millennials. Number eight, home straight, built to decay. There's a challenging world in the world of construction. Um, and the insight is, is and I, this really hurts me saying this as a designer, I'm kind of choking of it, but I think it really is around its behavior over appearance. It's increasing about what stalls do as opposed to what they look like. I'm choking on that. Let me kind of justify that. Um, we've all been designing stalls for, for decades where it was all about the quality of the material tools, the high quality finish, you know, and maybe 10 years of build quality on the ROI. But when you just look at a very simple diagram of um, uh, time over customer satisfaction, we launch a new store and it's super satisfying and relevant. And then over the next sort of three or four years, it starts to drop off. Massive capex up here. Then we do a mini modernization, 
and it might get it through another year, and then it really, really drops off. And then we used to get back into the cycle of a big total refurbishment, massive cost. But all this over here is the quality of the build that's, that's kind of irrelevant. So my provocation is now that we should actually design for 10 months visibility, not 10 years. And just why do I, why do I say that? Well, it's just kind of interesting. We've been road mapping uh, the future of retail for the last sort of three, five years. And we've started to notice the difference of a few years ago, a lot of retailers and big brands were talking about, OK, we need the now, next, and future of retail and how it kind of evolves. But this year, and it's really true, everybody's talking about now, near, and next, so much closer. So where, you know, get to the meet to the next four, maybe to five years. It's impossible to plan what actually happens five, ten years. I just think that's really interesting how that relates to materiality and sort of the, the quality of uh, the physical spaces. Personal favorite, my store, uh, a store that I love, Dover Street Market, luxurious sort of Japanese um, comte de garçon. Um, and here they actually juxtapose super high-end clothes and uh, handbags with super low-end materials. So it's very much about sort of paper and plastics and cardboard and, and, and cheap materiality. And it seems to work so well. That's sort of new, new luxury, if you like. So cheap as chips interior design. Number nine is to shift from return of investment to return on experience. Um, the insight there is friction can be a good thing. And you know, I hear this word friction is demonized in the media. It's always like, we've removed it, we've killed the friction. Actually, it can be a great thing. I was sitting in a, a, in a Starbucks in uh, Baltimore the other week, and I was watching people between 7.30 and 9.30 come in up uh, to 8.30 to come in, and they'd pre-ordered their coffee on their, on their smartphone. And they were coming to collect it off this little box, this little lectern. It was really interesting watching because they're all coming in and grabbing it. And only about a third made eye contact with the staff member. And very few actually spoke at all. So albeit we've fulfilled the opportunity of like the 22nd fulfillment, it's actually the having zero sort of Starbucks experience. It's very hard to sell them pumpkin lattes or new flavors or new products because they're in that absolute grab and go mode. Conversely, you know, uh, we were sort of early days involved with uh, Reserve. Um, that is one of the only ways to get new people into the Starbucks brand is using these sort of flagship experiences, bringing people in through super high experience. So I'm not advocating one or the other, but I think it's about both. Removing friction, adding friction. Uh, we've all read the data. We all know the deeper emotional connection that you have with a brand or retailer. Uh, it has so much more commercial worth. So how do we get those deeper emotional connections? And one of my sort of um, things I'm always annoyed about is the overuse of this word experience. I think it's one of the most laziest phrases in our industry. And what we've done at Fitch, that we, when we talk about something, we talk about a design that creates um, some sort of interaction with a, a shopper, a customer, which may, if we're lucky, stir an emotion. So final film. So those eight, uh, or abstractly shown there, are the, the universal eight core human emotions. You may think there are many others, but they're all secondary and tertiary that ramp up into these eight. And I kind of challenge you that you know, when you're creating new experiences, think about the, the emotion, the core emotion you want to stir in the, in the shopper. And each brand really kind of needs to have something slightly different there. And when you really connect on an emotional level, that's much more memorable than, say, doing something disruptive over there. Uh, 
And if you just do that emotion all the way through, it starts to become quite flat. So we're absolutely fascinated by the idea of creating a, a roller coaster of emotion. So again, if that was sort of a time axis, and this is pleasure, as opposed to just kind of keep it all flat, we're really into this idea of picking two moments, creating one super emotional high and a very strong end around your brand and the experience. And when you do that really well, it, it responds to this uh, uh, psychological uh, proven theory that's called the peak end rule, and it's how we remember experiences and how we recall. I could talk about that for an hour, so uh, I'll push on. Final one. Simple, smart, and savvy. You know, we're all frustrated. We could go into a store 10 times, and it's different staff every day, and they treat you like a stranger. We want to be, you know, we're, you know the apps that are on, they're so smart. They're learning with us. They're getting smarter every time. And really, that's what the future is, the store that has to get smarter with age. My final anecdote, uh, I was mystery shopping um, Tesla a few years ago, and they had, uh, you know, not very interesting interior, but the staff gentleman who was presenting it, he just said a fantastic line that sort of stopped me in my tracks. He said, this is the only car that gets smarter, and it doesn't uh, depreciate as soon as you drive it off the lot. The car will only get smarter. Every other car will just deteriorate. And that's just like, wow, that, that's what I think the store should be. And the best example, and I think some of you guys were talking about it yesterday, is, is the Melrose. And I've yet to go uh, over in LA. And well, where did it start? They asked the local community in that neighborhood of LA, what are you doing? What are you wearing? What are you into? And it's scraping all the data off that local app. And that becomes the, uh, the range selection, what merchandise is in store, the seasonality, and what products and services. So it's absolutely connected and listening to the local community. That starts to feel like a savvy store, not just a smart sort of omnichannel store. Really excited by that. So I've just ran through quite quickly 10 provocations of how we can start to reframe our heads and actively every day thinking about um, retail in a different way. And just run through that. What does it mean for you? Well, if you're a, if you're a retailer, if you're a brand owner, uh, what do you need to do in this new reality? Well, I imagine a lot of you are already going through some sort of organizational change in your business. It can't be how it's always been, and that's painful. Um, you need to evolve where the construction budgets come from, and it used to be just from, say, property, and now budgets to create these new type of experiences come horizontally you know, from a number of different uh, areas of the business. You have to embrace new methodologies and clearly take risks and innovate. It's interesting how the briefs, uh, retail briefs have changed. If I just step back five years ago, every RFP brief we had was called Project 2020. Then we got into omni-channel, multi-channel confusion area. At the moment, I think nine out of 10 briefs are entitled Store of the Future, but we're starting to see the next generation, which is innovating service design. Kind of feel that's where clients are kind of taking retail design. It's not about you, it's about us, the design and architectural innovation community. We need to evolve, and that's what we've been doing uh, heavily at Fitch the last few years. Uh, very painful changing and creating lots of sort of tools to help deliver a lot of these ideas and theories that I've been um, spouting on about. One thing we can't forget to do, though, is still be brilliant designers and architects, as well as all these new activities. So with that, uh, I'd like to say, uh, let's keep learning and be humble together. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you very much, Alison. <laughs>